Wow, wasn't that an awesome time of worship? Yeah, incredible, eh? Um, for those who are new or haven't been for a while, we're just journeying through the book of 1 Thessalonians. There's just something about that particular church community that really um, touched my heart when I started here at Rumataka. And I felt that that particular church had a few characteristics that would really be helpful for us to follow as a church who is serving God. And so we, last week we spoke about how we are justified and sanctified. Justified means that Jesus has died for us and it's a free gift. We don't have to do anything. This is God's love for us. Sanctified means that we, because of what God has done for us, we want to do the best we can, right, in our faith journey. And so we work at it. It's something that we participate with God in. And so we spoke about walking in holiness that we could do that because we are justified. We can stand before the Father justified. And so we can work out our faith. That doesn't mean it has to be perfect, but we can strive in our faith towards holiness in worship of God. And then we spoke about walking in love, love for our neighbor and each other and ourselves. And actually this week we're going to talk about that third one, which is walking in hope. So, let's get into chapter 4 again. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there with me. We're going to start from um, chapter 4, verse 13. I'll read to you if you haven't got your Bibles here. All right. We're going to go into chapter 5 as well, because that portion matches quite nicely with that last part of chapter 4. Okay, let's begin. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now into chapter 5. Now, brothers and sisters, About times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day, We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Isn't that a wonderful verse? Because that's insight into what's going to happen, right? Now, remember I said that Timothy had arrived, it would seem halfway through the, um, Paul writing this letter. And it's evident from this section um, that Timothy had not only returned to give Paul good news, but he had come with a few questions from the church in Thessalonia. You see, it seems as if some people had died um, in the church since Paul had left. And and uh, Paul finds out from Timothy that the Thessalonians are grieving quite badly. You know, they're quite inconsolable which mean kids, they can't find comfort in their grief. You know, they're just so sad. 
And Paul realizes that they're lacking in hope because they don't fully understand the teaching about the resurrection of those who are believers. So can anyone here tell me what resurrection means? Tanayi is on a roll again today, yeah? Coming back from the dead, being raised to life. So Paul has to remind them that just like Jesus died and rose again, so too the believers who die will be raised to life. Now, while they probably knew this, they were unsure of how this would work. You see, for many in that um, time, they thought Jesus was going to come in their lifetime. And so they were quite confused, you know, thinking that this death that their loved one had faced was final and could not be reversed. And so that they somehow lost the chance for resurrection. But Paul sets them straight. He says that even those who have already died will be raised to life. In fact, they'll be raised first. And then those who are still alive at the time of Jesus' coming will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and together we will be with the Lord. So I wonder, do you actually know as a Christian that death is actually not something to be overly concerned about or worried about? And even though the process of dying can be hard, what ultimately follows is Jesus. It's amazing. You know, in Philippians 1.21, Paul writes, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In fact, in other letters, Paul talks about his longing to be with the Lord. He can't wait. He's looking forward to it like you look forward to Christmas, or like you're about to go on this wonderful holiday. Death for the Christian, while sad for those left behind, is a joyous celebration for the one who is now in heaven. Can you imagine? It also means comfort to those left behind. You know, both my parents have passed away. And I tell you what, in the midst of my grief, one of my greatest comforts is knowing they're with the Lord. You know, and that one day we'll be together again. It's an amazing thing to think. And also one of my privileges um, as a pastor is to sit with those in the final stages of life. You know, often I, I walk into a room and I find a person who is anxious and unsettled. And it never fails to amaze me that the minute I remind them that God loves them, that he's waiting for them on the other side, how peaceful they become. Sometimes I read Psalm 23 or I play beautiful worship music and they are deeply comforted. Hope enters their hearts again. They pass from this life to the next peacefully and joyfully. Now Paul addresses another concern. So the Thessalonians are asking, if Jesus is to come then, When will he come? Let us know because we want to be prepared. And Paul uses some really interesting mental pictures to explain this. He tells them the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That's odd. Why a thief? Okay, let's play a game of true or false. Kids, okay? If I say something true, you say true. If I say something false, you say false. Got it? Okay. So I'm a thief... I'm going to sneak in at broad daylight when there's everybody around. False. False. Okay. I'm a thief. I'm going to call people up and say, I'm coming to your house to rob you. False. False. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm rather, I think rather maybe the best thing as a thief is to sneak in in the middle of the night when nobody's around, right? And it's dark and no one can see me. That way I can escape. True. Good. Okay, so, um, you know, a thief doesn't call you on the phone and say, hey, listen, (laughs) I'm coming to steal your your TV, because he knows if he does, he's going to get caught, right? So what Paul is saying here is not that Jesus is going to come and rob you, so kids, don't get any ideas. What he's saying is that Jesus is going to come in an unannounced fashion, like a thief would. Um, It's going to be unexpected, it's, it's going to be a surprise. 
It could happen a long time from now or in the next 60 seconds. Oh gosh, what if it's going to happen in the next 60 seconds? <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> okay, I think maybe we need to do a Jesus return drill. What do you think? Like we do an earthquake drill? So, if Jesus was to return in the next 60 seconds, hands up, who would feel prepared? Oh, I'm encouraged. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit, I'm not sure, I might be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Would my heart be ready? You know, is my faith ship shape? Um, what would I want to change if I still had time? It's a good question to ask ourselves. Because you see, Paul then uses another example. He describes Jesus' return like a woman who goes into labor. Quite a few women here gone into labor. Can you stop that process once it's started? No, it's inevitable, right? <laughs> Yeah, so there's no stopping the process. Um, we might not know the day or the time, but every day we are one day closer, one hour closer, one second closer. Jesus is coming soon. Think about it as something um, that is going to happen rather than something that's a long way off in the future, right? Because we want to shift our perspective. I want to be prepared when Jesus comes. I don't want to be caught out. And Jesus has an, I mean, sorry, Jesus, Paul has another illustration to help us with that too. He says, be encouraged for you are sons of the light and of the day, not the dark and of the night. So let's think of the contrast between light and dark, day and night. Imagine if an earthquake comes during the day. You're better able to cope with it, I think, right? Because you're alert, you're awake, you can see where you're going. <laughs> if it's in the middle of the night, that's not the case. You can move yourself to safety, and you're better able to make decisions. Because you just don't want to be on the alert. You want to be sober, like Paul says, not drunk. Again, an interesting way of looking at it. I don't think Paul is saying you don't want to be acting like you have a hangover on the day Jesus comes back. <laughs> Rather, I think he's saying you don't want to waste your time here on earth on things that aren't good for you. You might uh, want to be living a life where you're ticking off some of those things that you want to do on your faith bucket list. What does a faith bucket list look like? Maybe it's something like this. If Jesus came again, he would know that I tried to follow him with my whole heart. Or that I made every attempt to love those around me. I helped those less fortunate than myself. I used my mouth to praise him instead of swearing. He would know me as one of his disciples. Are you beginning to get the picture? Yeah. So Paul says, put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. If you're going to do battle, you need to wear the right armor, right? It's time for boot camp as Christians. Who's ever done boot camp at gym? Do one. <laughs> Makes us all look bad. Eh? <laughs> Usually it's at the crack of dawn because you want to prioritize it as the first thing you do at the start of your day. You're investing in your fitness. Now, if you're like me and a bit lazy, boot camp would actually kill me. <laughs> because A, I'm so unfit, and B, um, my body would need to exercise on a regular basis to cope with the high impact session that boot camp brings, right? So boot camp can only be survived if I'm disciplined. Hey, kids, have you ever noticed that there's a similarity between the word disciplined and disciple? Think about the word. Do your spelling. What's the same? Can you tell me? What about you guys here? Have you ever noticed that the, the first few words are the same? So I thought, this is interesting. I'm going to look this up on Google. Now, the word disciple comes from the Latin word 
disciplos, meaning a student. So not only is a disciple a follower, in reality, it means you're a student. The word discipline is from the Latin word disciplina, meaning instruction and training. It's derived from the root word discer, which means to learn. So what is discipline? Discipline is to study, to learn, to train and apply something in your life. What isn't discipline? Discipline is not rules or regulations or punishment. It's not compliance or enforcement. It's not rigid, boring, or always doing the same thing. That's why most of us don't like discipline, because we think it's those things. But it's not really. You see, discipline means that you don't just follow Jesus around like a puppy dog who's got food, I mean, like a baby, for, um, let me start again, like a puppy dog following a baby who has food in their hand, right? We don't just do that. We, we follow Jesus because we've learned that his ways are the only wise way to live life. You know it as a truth, like you know two plus two equals four. Also, discipline is not something others do for you. This is the hard bit. It's something you do for yourself. You can receive instruction or guidance from the Bible, your youth pastor over there, but unless you make an effort to make it a part of who you are, like you study your science for your homework so that you can pass your NCEA, you have to take what you have learned and make it a part of who you are. So discipline is not obedience to God's standards to avoid punishment. It's obedience out of knowing this is for your good and out of love and gratitude for what God has done for you. Faith is something we work on, we test and we grow stronger in. Discipline is a choice. It's my choice, it's your choice, it's a decision. Being a disciple is an active role, not a passive one. No faith couch potatoes allowed. Paul is saying each one of you have to put in the effort to make sure you are ready to stand before the Lord. My mum forgot to remind me. It's not going to work. <laughs> I was going to do that next week. Isn't going to cut it. Each one of us needs to take ownership of our faith. We need to do the Christian fitness circuit at the gym. We need to bench press some weights so that we can grow our faith muscle. We need to do cardio so that our hearts grow stronger and much more able to love others. And we need to protect our minds. And we do that with the helmet of hope. Interesting fact. Have you ever heard that marathon runners say the greatest challenge they faith, face is not their fitness, but in their mind's ability to believe they can do it. It's huge. Hope is like that. Hope is the thing we cling to when we feel the faith muscle burn, when you still have five kilometers to run in the marathon of faith. It's what keeps us in the game, keeps us focused, gets us over the finish line. That's what hope is. Lastly, Paul says that while most of this faith journey is focused on what we're doing for yourself, there's also something you can do for each other. Do you remember last week I said if a, a writer in the letters says something more than once, that's quite important to note. In chapter 4, verse 18, he says, Therefore encourage one another with these words. Chapter 5, 11 finishes with, Therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So we are called to be each other's cheerleaders. So next time you see someone from church, encourage them. Tell them what a good job they're doing with their faith journey. You know, if, if they're feeling a bit down, tell them, don't give up. It's going to be worth it. Just keep going. Just keep going. So... We know that we've got to walk in holiness, walk in love, and finally walk in hope. Because you see, when you see Jesus, you're not going to want to be standing back or feeling apprehensive. What are you going to want to do? 
you're going to want to run as fast as you can into his embrace because you know that you are loved and you are home. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. What an incredible God we serve. We have every reason to hope, even in this season where this virus is out there and we're all getting nervous. God is in control. Right? And if the worst happens, what's going to happen? God's going to happen. So let's pray. Thank you, Father God, that we don't have to live our lives struggling and without hope. You have given us every reason to live and live life abundantly. Thank you for your support of us, Lord. Thank you that you reached out to us before we even reach out to you. Help us, Lord, to grow in our faith. Help us to get stronger. Help us to walk in holiness in honor of your name. Help us to walk in love with each other. And Lord, above all else, help us in this time to walk in hope. Thank you that we can look ahead to the future and know it's going to be good because you are a good, good God. We praise you this morning, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm just going to get into another time of worship. We're going to sing a song that everyone knows or anyone has done before. It's how great is our God. So it just kind of follows up from all how King Jesus and just get in our praise. Um, so if you guys will stand up, I'll just give you something.